Uh, we're grateful again uh, to be here and to uh, have the opportunity to uh, share with you uh, this presentation is going to be uh, very in-depth and um, I'm, I'm sure you're going to have some questions. Um, <clears throat> hang on just a second. So I believe, so I am connected to the, the app where you can submit your questions, but you can also ask your questions, I believe, live in-house in as well uh, uh, via microphone so that everybody uh, can hear you. Uh, but um, let's do this. Uh, just let's try to ask the most immediate questions relative to this presentation and then the other questions regarding whatever was covered last night and then the previous night. So that way we can get the most immediate questions surrounding uh, the presentation here tonight, today rather. And, uh, and so today I, I am going to be talking about deconstructing false gospels. And in particular, we'll be looking at some of the tenets of oneness Pentecostalism or the apostolic faith as it relates to the gospel. As um, Pastor John Mark uh, hinted on, uh, I spent uh, well over 20 years in oneness circles, preaching, teaching, uh, doing apologetics, and um, being counted on, counted upon to explain to people what we believed. I did many debates, even against Trinitarians, and uh, so I spent a lot of time invested in believing this way. And um, as a result of teaching and studying the Word of God, God had really opened my heart and had given me a high view of Scripture. I loved the word, I did, and um, loving the word and seeking God's word, the Holy Spirit began to just guide me into greater study in his word, and I started questioning many of the things that, that I was teaching. Out of the concern for what John said, that let not many be teachers. Let, them, let not many be teachers. Because teachers have a greater judgment, a greater responsibility. And I thought about the awesomeness of the responsibility of knowing that people were staking their assurance on my ability to explain to them why they should continue to believe what they, what they did. And as a teacher, as a proponent, as a fierce and ardent defender, I started thinking, but what if I'm wrong? What if I'm wrong? How could I afford to be wrong about the gospel? And I think that if every person, whether you have made that migration theologically already or, or not, I think for those who may be on the fence, who may be wrestling, who may be questioning, who may be undecided, I think if you can entertain the possibility that you could be wrong. You might hear God speak to you regarding the truth of the gospel. And so deconstruction is about tearing things down. 
Jeremiah chapter 1, if you look there, this is one of my favorite verses. When God called Jeremiah, he said, the word of the Lord came to me. In verse 5, I chose you before I formed you in the womb. I set you apart before you were born. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. But I protested, oh no, Lord, God, look, I don't know how to speak since I am only a youth. Then the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a youth. He says, um, for you will go to everyone I send you to and speak whatever I tell you. Do not be afraid of anyone for I will be with you to rescue you. This is the Lord's declaration. Then the Lord reached out his hand, touched my mouth, and told me, I have now filled your mouth with my words. Verse 10. See, I have appointed you today over nations and kingdoms. Look at these words. To uproot, to tear down, to destroy and demolish, to build, and to plant. You'll notice immediately that these verbs deal with two things. One, agriculture, and the other, construction. The agricultural terms are uproot and plant. The construction terms are tear down, destroy, demolish, and build. Out of these six things, four of them are negative and two are positive. The positive two are building and planting, agriculture and construction. The negative four is, the, is what needs to happen before the positive two. That if you want to plant something, sometimes you've got to uproot things first. And if you want to build something, you've got to tear things down to demolish, destroy, and build. So these are not bad things. This is what needs to happen in order to ensure that we're building a solid foundation. You can't have a good foundation and then pour a bad foundation on top of it. The bad foundation has got to be torn down. And this is what deconstruction is. When we're teaching the word of God, we are often doing both at the same time. Constructing truth and deconstructing error. And so today, what I want to do in this first session is I want to get into some of the history of how we ended up where we are. How, how, how this movement and this teaching came about. Now I know that on the websites they talk about going all the way back to AD 33 and what the apostles said and this, that, or the other. But that's not true. Pente oneness Pentecostalism comes from classical Pentecostalism. Classical Pentecostalism preceded or came before the oneness movement. That movement was started by a man by the name of Charles Fox Parham. That is the gentleman to the left. He is what you would call a restorationist. Here's the interesting thing. Restorationist movements in the 19th century, most of them are cults. The Church of Christ, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, the uh, Christadelphians, the, 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 the Universalist 
movements. All of these groups are an example of what you would call restorationism. The black Hebrew Israelites and a number of different groups. What they have in common is this idea that is often referred to as Christian primitivism. It is the idea that there needs to be a return back to primitive Christianity. That somewhere after the time of the apostles, the church fell into apostasy. They all believe that way. And they believe that through their founder or their leader, usually by way of a vision, God has restored those lost truths back to their remnant group. Their remnant group believes that they are the ones with the truth and other groups are not. Those groups tend to have several characteristics. One, they tend to be exclusivist. It's us. We're the ones, the only ones that are right. We're the only true ones. They also tend to be arrogant. That is, the inability to humble themselves and be corrected by the truth of Scripture. They also tend to be legalistic, very strict about the way that people live and dress. They also tend to believe that denominations are of the devil and they're really evidence of apostasy per celebrating Christmas and Easter and other holidays. These are all examples of Christendom, which is really just a daughter of the Roman Catholic Church. They also tend to practice what you would call historical revisionism. In other words, when they look at history, particularly church history, they revision it according to ideas that are not consistent with what really happened. So they tend to be conspiracy theorists about the past. They believe that God has restored lost truths through their group. So Charles Par Fox Parham was a restorationist. He was a 19th century Methodist minister who believed that God was going to restore all of the gifts of the Spirit in the end times. I want you to notice, follow me where it's going so we can track, plot how we got to the oneness movement. Parham thought that the chiefest of all of the gifts that God was going to restore was going to be the gift of tongues. And the reason that he believed this was because Parham was interested in seeing the Lord's return. And that's another characteristic of restorationist groups. They tend to have a obsession with eschatology. They have these views about the end times when it seems in their eschatological views that God is going to vindicate their group by destroying everybody else. So Parham believed that the end that we were in fact in the end time and since the gospel needed to be preached in the world around the world before the before Christ came Charles Fox Parham envisioned that what God was going to do was give the church the gift of tongues so that they would be able to expedite the Lord's return by going into the mission field and communicating with indigenous people without having to learn the language. So he called it missionary tongues. This is the man that started the whole deal. Interestingly, 
He started a Bible school called Bethel Bible Institute in Topeka, Kansas. He started getting a number of Bible college students. And in 1900, on December 21st, they dismissed for Christmas break. Came back after Christmas and had a service on December 31st, 1900. Before they dismissed, Parham asked his students, I want you to look through the book of Acts and I want you, when you come back from break, to tell me what the consistent initial physical sign or evidence is of a person receiving the Holy Spirit? That was the question he asked them. On December 31st, when they returned back to the Bible college, they had a worship service, some teaching, and Parham instructed his students to seek for the baptism of the Spirit which they believed was a second work of grace. They had it in their mind that you could be saved first. This was an idea that was already floating around in the Methodist groups and in some of the Wesleyan and fire baptized holiness movements preceding Pentecostalism. So this wasn't a strange idea about seeking for a greater experience and seeking for more. Parham, however, put that second work of grace seeking with his theology. And he told them that they should seek for this outpouring of the Spirit, this second work of grace. And by midnight, December 31st, on New Year's Day, morning 1901 a young lady by the name of Agnes Osmond was reported as having been the first to have this experience and speak in this gift of tongue word got around and people started coming from everywhere to experience it and to become part of Parham's Bible school so we started another school in Houston, Texas, and an African-American Methodist preacher by the name of William Joseph Seymour became a student. Fun fact, sad fact, Charles Fox Parham was a racist. He was in the Ku Klux Klan or the KKK. He was a grand wizard in the KKK. Yeah, the founder of Pentecostalism. So racist that he would not even allow Seymour into the class to study with the other whites. So Seymour had to sit out in the hallway and listen to the lecture. Seymour became impressed by Parham's message, did not have the experience but was excited about it. So he purchased himself a train ticket and went to Los Angeles, California. While he was in LA, he started preaching Parham's message. He had never contributed theologically to its development. He just became an evangelist for it. Preaching it and became popular preaching it. At first reception, some of the churches in Los Angeles kicked him out of the church. Others welcomed him because they wanted to hear this new message. Ultimately, at 216 North Bonnie Bray Street, Seymour started a prayer meeting in a, a small cottage. There were a number of Persian immigrants and Russian immigrants in this neighborhood, one was named Andrew Urshan. You might know that name. They started praying, and it was reported that there were individuals 
who were now experiencing Parham's gift of tongues by way of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That is evidenced by speaking in tongues. The prayer meeting became so large that they had to rent out an old livery stable at 312 Azusa Street. This was the beginning of what was called the Azusa Revival. Now, interesting fact. The LA Times and Frank Bottleman and many other eyewitnesses that were there reported that what was going on was chaotic. There was no structured teaching, no sound theology, no doctrine. In fact, anybody could be the speaker on any given night. All you had to say was the Holy Spirit was moving me to be the speaker. It was described as essentially a gathering of occultists, people practicing psychism, occultism, witchcraft, and all kinds of people from various churches who were curious about what was going on flocked to Azusa. Some came from Wales, as far as Wales. Others came from Scotland and England and all over the United States. And it was reported that Seymour spent most of his day with his head under a shoebox praying. When Parham arrived, there was conflict between them, and one obvious reason for that was racism. Blacks and whites were there together and singing together, worshiping together, and it had been reported in one periodical, they said that the blood had washed the color line away. Parham didn't care for that so much, but in his own journaling, he talked about confronting Seymour, who told him, this has gotten out of hand and I can't control it. It's, it's like a runaway train. Parham began to observe and he said that he noticed that there were all kinds of people babbling and gibbering and saying unintelligible things. Interestingly, Parham, the founder and the architect of this doctrine, didn't even agree that what they were doing was speaking in tongues. Parham, at least to his credit, understood that the gift of tongues was not a heavenly language, but an earthly language that was given to people supernaturally by the Holy Spirit because they did not know the language. Parham understood that the gift of tongues involved the spiritual, supernatural ability of God to speak a language unknown to the speaker for the purposes of the gospel. He at least had that part right. When he observed what was going on at the Apostolic Faith Gospel Mission on Azusa Street, he said, this is not of God because this is gibberish. This is not even human languages. It was being imitated by all kinds of people. This was the early start of the Pentecostal movement. Roughly about seven years later, the Pentecostal movement continues to grow. And they decide that we don't really have a denomination. Most of them were opposed to denominations. In fact, Pentecostalism, rightly understood, was a reaction to what they considered dead orthodoxy. So they, they were looking for something more spirited, more vibrant, more alive. So they decided, well, we need to get together at least sometime. And they put together the historical 1913 Worldwide Camp Meeting in Arroyo Seco, California. This camp meeting changed the world. 
There were a number of speakers over this entire week. And one of the speakers was the gentleman to the left named R.E. McAllister, Robert Edward McAllister. He was a Canadian minister, a Pentecostal, lifelong Trinitarian. Never stopped believing in the orthodox view of God. McAllister later began, came to regret one mistake that he made at that camp meeting. He thought that he had gotten a revelation from God, having looked at Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Acts chapter 8, verse 16, Acts chapter 10, verse 47, Acts chapter 19, and verse 5, and thought that God had showed him a pattern of baptism that he thought had been lost to the church. And that God was, here's that word again, restoring an ancient apostolic truth that had been lost. And so on his night to preach, he got up to preach about that. Church historians refer to it as the shot heard around the world. It sent the camp meeting into disarray. Others were confused and some were giving into it right away and rebaptisms were taking place all over the place. John Shep to the right was a little confused about what was going on and committed that night to reading over those scriptures, reading over them and rereading it and rereading it. And somewhere in the middle of the night, he starts running and ripping through the camp, screaming, I got it. I see it. I got the revelation. And he becomes an evangelist and a proponent for baptizing in the name of Jesus. Now, up to this point, none of them believe that it's salvific. For them, it just seems like a lost truth that's being restored. The very next year, white ministers pulled out of the oldest Pentecostal denomination in the world, the Church of God in Christ, that was founded by an African American by the name of Charles had it Harrison Mason, Bishop C.H. Mason. The white ministers pulled out of the assemblies of God, I mean, out of the Kojic Church of God in Christ and formed their own movement called the Assemblies of God. This is a year later. But by the time they formed it, they had a crisis on their hand. This baptism thing was the biggest issue that everybody was talking about. The Assemblies of God as an infant denomination is struggling with holding their fellowship together because half their fellowship was divided over whether to follow Matthew 28, 19 and the other was whether to follow what they considered the formula that McAllister had preached about a year earlier. So the Assemblies of God called it the new issue. The new issue. By the end of 1914, they had to call a second council. Most denominations have one council, one convention, or one conference a year. The Assemblies of God was growing so large and this new issue was becoming such a hot button topic that they had to have a second council by November of 1914. By this time, the leaders of the Assemblies of God started saying, listen, brothers, it is fine if some of you want to baptize people in Jesus' name. It is also fine if some of you want to baptize as you have already been doing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But we implore you, brothers, not to divide over this issue because it is not salvific anyway. So, let every man be persuaded in his own mind. 
Well, the Jesus name proponents were not satisfied with that. They believed that what they had discovered was an apostolic truth. And everybody needed to be doing it. It was the only right way to do it. And so they kept pushing the issue. When the Pentecostal evangel, which was the periodical of the assemblies of God, would report conversions and baptisms, everybody was in the rush to say, we have four baptized today in Jesus' name. And others would say, oh, we had three baptized in, in First Pentecostal Church in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the editors of the Pentecostal Evangel decided that we'll just report baptisms and we won't say anything about how because they were trying to keep the fellowship together. By 1915, a debate broke out. Frank J. Ewart had written a book about baptism in Jesus' name and sent it around to ministers in the assemblies of God. His good buddy Glenn Cook teamed up with him and they started preaching about this baptism and they were a lot more charismatic than, than Shep was. And so some of the presbyters and ministers and pastors in the assemblies of God started sending out letters warning some of the brothers not to pay any attention to Ewart and Cook because their message was divisive. And so they reached out to Garfield T. Garfield Thomas G.T. Haywood Garfield Thomas Haywood in Indianapolis, Indiana. He was a presbyter in the Assemblies of God and had at that time the largest church in their fellowship. He had well over 2,000 members and growing. Somebody sent him a letter and said, Pastor Haywood, don't pay any attention to what Ewart and Cook are saying. They're trying to divide the fellowship. G.T. Hayward wrote back and said, your message has reached me too late. I've already been to the water and I've already been rebaptized in Jesus' name. Because of G.T. Hayward's stature in the assemblies of God, it sent shockwaves across their fellowship. But the biggest shockwave to come was when their chairman, their general chairman, Ian Bell, Eudorus Neander Bell, also got rebaptized. By this time, the fellowship is reeling and rocking and not knowing what to do. And so, in 1915, they call a debate. And Haywood, Ian Bell, and one or two others debated the issue defending baptism in Jesus' name at the 1915 General Council of the Assemblies of God. The Assemblies of God had others debating for the continuation of Matthew 28, 19. A fateful mistake occurred during the debate that created oneness Pentecostalism. Because up to this point, everybody still believes in the Trinity. Everybody still believes up to this point in justification by faith. Everybody. The only difference with this group is that they believe in this second work of grace, this baptism of the Holy Spirit, which they wrongly disconnected from the moment of salvation. They saw it as a second work. But up to this point, they're all Trinitarian. They all believe in the essentials of the gospel, justification by faith. But in their zeal, 
to defend what they thought was the rightness of baptizing in Jesus' name, they made a very faithful error. One of them attempted to explain Matthew 28, 19 as a proof text for baptizing in Jesus' name. And he said, the scriptures tell us that we ought to go and make disciples baptizing them in the name singular. Therefore, there must be a single name for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that name must be Jesus. So the only right way to understand this verse is that it's really telling us to baptize in Jesus' name because the name of Jesus is the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And one of the other debaters said, Whoa! This has gone now well beyond a debate about baptism. This is now heresy. Because what you are arguing now is what is historically referred to in church history as modalism. Sabellianism. That God is one being and one singular person. That Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are but mere roles of the one person. They didn't start out as oneness. They just thought they found some truth in baptism and stumbled into heresy out of a zeal for trying to prove baptism in Jesus' name. And so now the assemblies of God is like, okay, now this is trouble. So in 1916, they adopted a statement of faith that condemned modalism and the practice of baptizing in Jesus' name out of that understanding. When they did that, 156 oneness left the general council of the assemblies of God. They went and joined up with a group called the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. Interestingly, this group had been Trinitarian since 1906. They had a bishop, an African American by the name of J.J. Frazee. Somewhere in between 1906 and 1916, 10 years, the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World had become, as a result of the 1916 split, the PAW had gotten converted to become a oneness denomination. This was the oneness faction's first denomination. This is their oldest group. Whites and blacks together in this new group. Well, just like many of them had did with the Kojic, so they did it with the PAW. The whites left in 1924 to form their own oneness groups. Bishop G.T. Hayward was appointed then the presiding bishop of that movement. Stay with me because I want you to get the history and you'll see where I'm going there. Here's a development of these denominations. The 1924 racial exodus from the PAW and then in 1925, three new oneness movements formed. They started forming like Apostolic Churches of Jesus Christ, the Pente Pentecostal Ministerial Alliance, the Emmanuel's Church in Jesus Christ, not the one here, 
This one was started in New York. 1927, the Apostolic Church of Jesus Christ and the Emmanuel Church in Jesus Christ merged to form the Apostolic Church of Jesus Christ. Then in 31, the Apostolic Church of Jesus Christ merged back in with PAW and retained the latter name, PAW. Then in 31, another new one in this group called the Pentecostal Assemblies of Jesus Christ formed. And then the next year, another one called the Pentecostal Ministerial Alliance formed and changed their name to the Pentecostal Church Incorporated. Then in 1945, something big happened. The Pentecostal Church Incorporated and the Pentecostal Assemblies of Jesus Christ merged to form what is today the largest oneness denomination in the world, and that is the United Pentecostal Church International. Now, not to be outdone, the black ministers were also forming their own movements as well. We already heard in 1906 about the PAW, but then there was one PAW minister in Columbus, Ohio, by the name of Robert Clarence Lawson, who left the PAW over a disagreement with Bishop Haywood about divorce. He moved to Harlem and started Refuge Temple Church of Our Lord Jesus Christ of the Apostolic Faith, Cool JC. In 1930, Sherrod Johnson left Cool JC and founded Church of not our Lord, but Church of the Lord Jesus Christ of the Apostolic Faith. Just we're just changing our to the, that's it. And we're keeping all of the same beliefs, but we're going to be a whole lot more stricter than the other group. This is the apostolic tree that Geno Jennings comes from. Cotton stockings, no hair straightening, and all of that stuff. That's where y'all got that from. Then in 38, Henry C. Brooks founded the Way of the Cross Churches of Christ in Washington, D.C. And then in 57, Smallwood Williams, who pastored Bible Way Temple in D.C., left the Church of Our Lord Jesus Christ and founded Bible Way Church of Our Lord Jesus Christ. These are all denominations whole lot of leaving and starting my I'm just going to take my ball and bat and just go start my own team then in 57 Samuel L. Samuel N. Hancock out of Detroit left PAW also and founded the PCAF the Pentecostal Churches of the Apostolic Faith but not to be outdone here on this island in this country in 1945, Charles Walsh and Mother Christine Walsh also left the PA of W of Jamaica and founded the Shiloh Apostolic Church. They produced a whole lot of people, but four years later, Ralph Reynolds was appointed to come to Jamaica as the general super or the district superintendent and along with Mother J.C. Russell incorporated the United Pentecostal Church of Jamaica. You know the story, don't you? And in 1961, Mother Movina White founded Emmanuel Apostolic Church. And in 1965, Monroe Saunders out of Baltimore, teamed up with Sidney A. Dunn out of the UK and formed the first United Church of Jesus Christ Apostolic. Ultimately, in 1991, Saunders and Dunn split and Dunn formed Bethel United Church of Jesus Christ. You should know that Big church over there on South Camp Road. Here's some statistics for you. The United Pentecostal Church International is the largest oneness denomination and grew from roughly 521 churches in 1945 to over 42,000 churches and 5.2 million members globally. 
And you're probably saying, why are you saying all of that? Because if that many people have the wrong gospel, we've got problems. There are estimated 1,100 oneness Pentecostal denominations in the U.S. alone. Or as oneness folk, Pentecostals, period, don't like to use the word denomination, so they say organizations. As though, you know, coffin, casket, same thing. There are several hundred foreign denominations and an estimated 30 plus million oneness Pentecostals globally. Here's what oneness Pentecostals believe. Here are their doctrinal distinctives. One, they believe that baptism must be by immersion in Jesus' name. And pay attention to the word must. Secondly, they believe that it is essential to salvation. In other words, if you have not been baptized in Jesus' name, you can't be saved. They also hold to what I described earlier, as a modalistic or Sabellian view of God. Interestingly, all of the 19th century restorationist groups also reject the Trinity. Well, they joined them. Hence the name oneness. As a result of their staunch rejection of the Trinity. Oneness groups believe that salvation i.e. being filled with the Holy Spirit, is evidenced universally in every case by speaking in tongues. And that if you have not spoken in tongues, it is because you have not received the Holy Spirit. Most oneness groups, not all, but most, are very strict and legalistic as it relates to what is called holiness standards or outward holiness. These are the kind of things that separate them from the world. And as indicated earlier, restorationist groups are known for their exclusivism and their separatism. The interesting thing, however, among the oneness groups is that their holiness standard is not just designed to be a way of distinguishing themselves from the world. It is indicative of their salvation. Let me say that again. It is indicative of their salvation. Therefore, a lack of adherence to holiness standards can therefore result in one losing their salvation. So in that culture, conformity and acclamation are very important. You have to learn to adapt a certain way of looking. That way of looking is described as holy. So you could walk down the street and see somebody's holiness. I'm holy, just look at me. You can tell I'm holy by what I'm not wearing. Now, why this is so important is because this also sets up this movement to embrace a salvation by works in a way that is most unsuspecting. You have heard many times, pursue peace with all men and without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. So in a sneaky devilish roundabout way Satan found a way to get this group to believe that there's justification on the other side of sanctification 
So that if you pursue sanctification in your holy living and holy look, you'll end up justified in the end. But the gospel declares that we are justified by faith and our sanctification is the result of our justification. So they interpret that verse to mean to pursue holiness living so that I can see the Lord. So the standards really become another doctrine of salvation. And that is why we used to be so proud. I'm, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking in tongues, baptized in Jesus' name, living a holy and godly life. What we were doing was articulating what our gospel was. Filled with the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking in tongues, baptized in Jesus' name, living a holy and godly life. Because that's salvation. You got to, and we would tell people, well, you know, the Baptists, you know, they, 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 you know, they, you know, they're, they're sincere. You know, the, the Methodists in them, the, the Presbyterians in them, they, you know, that's good. But you, you got to, you're just on first base. You, you, you're almost there. You're close. But you, you got to, you got to go to second base. There's another step. Heard that before? And, and then after that base, there's third base. And, and then you got to bring it all the, way, all the way around home. In other words, faith alone in Christ alone is not enough. So you got to do what we are doing. Got to be baptized in Jesus' name. Got to speak in tongues because that's the sign that you've got the, the, got the Holy Ghost. And you got to say it like that. You can't say Holy Spirit. You got to say Holy Ghost. So it's just more spiritual, you know, Holy Ghost. <laughs> Holy Ghost. <laughs> just cut the T off the end, Holy Ghost. It's just, it's just more spiritual. And then you quicken with it too, you know, Holy Ghost. <laughs> so, hold on. So, hang in there with me. One that's Pentecostalism then teaches that a person must be baptized in the name of Jesus according to what they see as an apostolic formula in Acts 2, 38, 8, 16, 10, 48, 19, 5 in order to be saved. This view adds the act of baptism to the gospel as a condition for salvation, making it salvation by works rather than salvation by faith alone in Christ. Here's what they believe about baptism in Jesus' name. Here's, here's some important things to understand about baptism from a biblical standpoint. First of all, in the name of Jesus is not a baptismal formula. None of the verses in Acts are actually indicating what formula persons were baptized in. That's not what Luke is communicating at all. In the name of is an idiom. It is a idiomatic phrase that indicates something else. Not the invocation. It's not giving you the formula for the baptismal invocation. What it's indicating is by what authority they were baptized in person. Well, how can you be so sure, Richardson, since you used to preach the message before and you were so convinced then, how could you be so sure? Well, it's quite interesting that folks start reading Matthew 28, 19 and skip over 18. You want to know what 18 said? All authority, this is Jesus now, all authority in heaven and in earth has been given unto me. Go, therefore. That is, in the light of my authority, 
with my authority and make disciples. The chief verb in verse 19 is make disciples. It's not go. It's make disciples. Every other verb is what you would call a participle. These are words that are acting like verbs that are hanging from the main verb. So Matthew is trying to tell you how disciples are made. Well, first, you baptize them by the authority of Jesus. The same authority that he said all belongs to me. Make disciples by that authority. And so if we're making disciples by that authority, then every aspect of discipleship is by the authority of Jesus. Well, what else? Baptize by that authority. What else? Teach by that authority. Teaching them to observe all things, whatever I have commanded you, and I will be with you even until the end of the world. So what Luke is describing is how they practiced baptism and by what authority authority they did it name there is indicative of the person of Jesus and his authority you've got in Acts 3 I want you to look there with me go to Acts chapter 3 let's get into some scripture Acts chapter 3 remember the story of Peter and John going to the beautiful gate of the temple and the text tells us that they ran across a guy who had been crippled begging in the verse 3 and when he saw Peter and John about to enter the temple he asked for money Peter along with John looked straight at him and said look at us so he turned to them expecting to get something from them. But Peter said, I don't have silver or gold, but what I do have, I give you. Watch this. Look at this screen. It says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That sound familiar? In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Now, let me ask you this question. Is this indicative of a healing formula? Is, 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 is this a healing formula? That in order for people to be healed, you have to say in the name of Jesus. Because if you don't say the name of Jesus, healing can't occur. Because if we're going to do that to baptism, we've got to do that to healing here. But notice what Peter says when the man is healed and when individuals were surprised. Peter when he saw this, he addressed the people, verse 12, and said, fellow Israelites, why are you amazed at this? Why do you stare at us as though we had made him walk, watch this now, by our own power or godliness? The word power there is from the Greek word for authority. You'll notice that Peter says, I don't know why you're looking at us like we did it, this man is, watch now, walking by what? By the authority of Jesus. That is what Peter and John were appealing to when they spoke to the man. Not to a formula, not to some verbal invocation, but to the authority and power of the person of Jesus. Same thing in Acts 16, 18. You don't have to turn there. I'll be gone before you get there. But Paul and the demon-possessed young woman, he says to the woman, in the name of Jesus, come out of her. So I'm wondering if we need a form. Is there a formula for casting out demons? That demons can't be cast out unless you say in the name of Jesus? Or did the demons come out of the woman by Jesus' authority? Because Paul certainly didn't get the demon out of the woman. So it was authority that the demons were obeying. But whose authority? Jesus' authority. 
which is exactly what the statement means. In the name of Jesus, by his authority, come out. And what about this? Colossians 3 and 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of Jesus. So I guess everything we do, we've got to be invocating the name over everything. Invite somebody over to the house. Well, in the name of Jesus, sit down on the couch. In the name of Jesus, I'm turning on the television. In the name of Jesus, I'm about to open my Bible. In the name of Jesus, I'm starting my car up. I mean, because after all, Paul said, whatever you do in word or deed. So are we going to be literal and make an invocation and a formula out of that? Or is Paul saying something else? That everything you do by faith and practice, do it in the name that is in the authority and in the reputation and to the honor of Jesus. Diana Ross and the Supremes, I can't sing, but some of you can. I'll just try it. You remember Diana Ross and the Supremes? They just, stop in the name of love. Remember that? Before God. All right. Good. I mean, but what was she saying? What's the name of the law? What's the name of the law? Is the name of the law the law? I mean, what's the actual name of the law? There is no name of the law. She's saying stop by the authority of the law. In the very same way, police officers say that. The name of the law is not the law. The name of the law is the authority of the law. Stop by the authority of the law. Matthew 28, 19, the fateful verse that those oneness messed up. It says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, I provided the Greek text for you. Can y'all read it? It's Greek to you, right? <laughs> Let me help you understand how to make biblical sense out of that. Greek grammarian by the name of Granville Sharp created some, and when I say created, these things are discovered by learning language. Just like math is not created, it's discovered. He discovered that there were certain ways that Greek language worked, Koine Greek. And what he found was, is that when multiple personal nouns in a sentence are used, and each one of those nouns have the definite article, which is the word the, before each noun, and each noun is separated by the conjunction chi or an, what he found was is, is that that denotes distinct persons. So in Matthew 28, 19, you'll see there that baptism here is, notice in the second line, Tau patras. Tau is the definite article the. Patros means father. Tau patras chi and, that's the father and, notice, tau huyu, that's and the son. Chi and definite article. the Holy Spirit. Each one of those is a personal noun. But each one of those personal nouns have a definite article 
each separated by the conjunction and. In Greek grammar, that means that those nouns are distinct nouns or distinct persons. They can't be the same person. They just can't be. And I just wish that G.T. Hayward and whoever else was helping him debate that day would have understood this. Because there wouldn't be a oneness movement if they did. Because after all, the oneness movement was an accident. They were only trying to debate for baptism and stumbled into modalist heresy by making a bad argument. That's a historical fact. Now, look at, for an example, 2 Corinthians 3, 13, 14. Let me read this real quick, show you how this works. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. Is it? 2 Corinthians 13. 13, 13. I'm sorry. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Do you see the definite article before each personal noun? And do you see the word and separating each noun, which is then preceded by a definite article on and on and on? That is because in verse 13, the Lord Jesus Christ, God, who is a reference to the Father, and the Holy Spirit are distinct persons. That's what this means. They're all equally God but they're not the same person. I'll give you another example. Compare this with 1 Thessalonians 3.11. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. Now, Hold on, hold that. First John 1 and 3. I want to show you something real quick. First John 1 and 3. What we have seen and heard, we also declare to you so that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. You can see the distinction there. But turn back to the Gospel of John, chapter 20. This is where Jesus appears to Thomas. Now, verse 27, then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here and look at my hands. Reach out your hand, put it, in the, in, put it into my side. Don't be faithless, but believe. Thomas responded to him, my Lord and my God. So I've heard some wonders people say, aha, 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 gotcha. It doesn't work here because my Lord and my God are both separated by Kai. But here, my Lord and my God refer to the same person. You don't need the rule to know that because the text tells you that Thomas responded to him singular not to them but to him he called him singular Lord and God so he wasn't referring to two distinct persons he was referring to one person as both being Yahweh and Elohim So, there are rules to this. And I'm not trying to get you to take Greek course. I'm just wanting you to know that the New Testament wasn't written in English. It was written in Greek. If two nouns, adjectives, or participles, here's some conditions to that rule, are connected with the word chi and, and a definite article, the, precedes the first noun 
but not the second. Then both nouns refer to the same person. You ever read something like, blessed, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? God and Father refer to the same person. And how do I know? Because the definite article is in front of God, but it's not in front of Father. If it were in front of Father, those would be two distinct nouns. But when the definite article is in front of the first noun and not the second, it refers to the same person. So blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ refers to God the Father. It also needs to agree in gender, number, and case. That's grammar stuff. It needs to be a personal noun. That is describing a person, not a thing. And it can't be a proper noun. So it can't say John or Peter, James or Damon. It has to be a personal noun, not a proper noun. So those are some of the grammatical rules. If they had known that, they would have never argued the way that they did. Well, what history do we have in Scripture attesting to, outside of the Bible, that the early church baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit? The oldest extra-biblical document or literature produced by the church is called the Didache. The Didache. That means the teaching. It was written somewhere between 70 A.D. and 100 A.D. within the same lifetime of the apostles. Here's what it says about baptism. Concerning baptism, baptize thus, having first rehearsed all these things, baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit in running water. That tells you that they were still a heavy Jewish influence because tabila, which was ritual immersion, was always practiced in a mikvah, which was a pool with running water. So that tells you that the early church up to this point is still very heavily Jewish. But if you have no running water, baptize in other water. And if you can't, cannot in cold, then in warm. But if you have neither, pour water three times on the head in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Well, it looked like they were reading Matthew 28, 19. And these are early Christians. First century, by the way. Tertullian, in his apologetic against Praxius, said, after his resurrection, he promises in a pledge to his disciples that he will send the promise of the Father, Luke 24, 49, and lastly, he commands them to baptize in the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, not into a unipersonal God. So Tertullian was already dealing with the same kind of mindset even then. And notice he says, and indeed, it is not only once, but three times that we are immersed into the three persons at each several mention of their names. That's circa 210. Hippolytus, a few years later, mentions some of the very same thing. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty? And the one being baptized shall answer, I believe. He shall then baptize each one of them once, laying his hand upon each of their heads. Then he shall ask, do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? And then upon the person who is born of the Holy Spirit, the Virgin Mary, crucified under Pontius Pilate, died and rose on the third day, living from the dead and ascended into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father. This is what they're saying while the person is in the baptism pool. And then the person says, yes, I believe. And then they ask, and do you believe in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Church and the resurrection of the flesh? And then each being baptized shall answer, I believe. And thus let him baptize the third time. So they were literally taken down three times in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's what the literary evidence shows us about how the early church practiced baptism. Beware of doctrines that develop 1,500, 1,700, and 1,900 years later. 
by somebody from Oklahoma who thinks that they know more than the early church did. Justin Martyr, in the middle of the second century, said, For in the name of God the Father and the Lord of the universe and of our Savior Jesus Christ and of the Holy Spirit, they then receive washing with water, which is a reference to baptism. Now, I'm going to start winding it down here because I want to get to the questions. Have any of you ever seen that baptism track that claims baptism, the early church baptized in Jesus' name, and then they've got all of these references from encyclopedias, Bible dictionaries. Anybody of y'all, y'all ever seen that one? Raise your hand if you've seen that one. That one is really popular. They still sell it. It's like $1.20 on the Pentecostal Publishing House website. You can order a whole stack of them and give them out. I've taken the liberty to copy them down. Now, most of them, I'll say this. We won't go through all of them. But most of them don't even say what they say the entry says. Many of them have been changed in order to reflect the idea. But here's the thing that I want you to notice. It doesn't matter if the Encyclopedia Britannica said the early church baptized in Jesus' name. It doesn't matter if the Caney Encyclopedia of Religion says it. It doesn't matter if the Catholic Encyclopedia says it. It doesn't matter if Hastings Encyclopedia of Religion says it. It doesn't matter if they say it again. It doesn't matter if the Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics agree with it. Or the Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible says the same thing. Or the History of Christian Thought. Or Hastings Dictionary, again. Or the History of the Christian Church, William Williston Walker. Or New Shaft Herzog Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge. Or Caney's Encyclopedia, again. Or Encyclopedia Biblica. Or the Britannica, again. You want to know why it doesn't matter? Because at the end of the day, I'm going to tell you how this works. If somebody says something was done, they're making a claim, and that's it. Anybody can make a claim, even scholars. What we need to see is the evidence. Because you can't make up evidence out of thin air. So if somebody says to me, man, you know what, Tertullian was a light-skinned dude with short hair and waves. Now, I know you didn't know Tertullian. You could not have known Tertullian. So I need to know how you know that Tertullian was a light-skinned African with short hair with waves. How do you know that? Since you didn't know him. You didn't live around that time. If he was light-skinned with waves... The only way that you could know that is that you read what is called primary source evidence. That means that you read a piece of literature from the time of Tertullian where somebody who had seen Tertullian said it. Otherwise, where did you get it from? So it doesn't matter if a million encyclopedias say that the early church baptized in Jesus' name and the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was a later development. At the end of the day, what I want to know from that historian is, where did you get that from, though? Since, I mean, you wasn't part of the early church. And I mean, since you wasn't around when they were baptizing. And I mean, since you didn't get baptized in the first century or in the second century, how do you know? And what you'll notice is, as each one of these entries do not cite their source, they just make the claim. And that is exactly what you find cults do. They are good at making claims and poor at proving them. The proof, however, from Scripture and from extra-biblical evidence, literary evidence, shows us exactly how the early church baptized and why. They did not baptize individuals in order to be saved. 
They baptized them because they were. I did two slides and we'll go to question. Here's a book I want everybody to get, if you can. It's by Lars Hartman. He wrote a book called Into the Name of the Lord Jesus, Baptism in the Early Church. What Hartman discovered through research was the phrase into the name, into the name of, doesn't matter what you put on the end of it. You can say into the name of Hercules, doesn't matter. The phrase into the name of was a Hebraic idiom that carried not just the idea of authority, but it carried the idea of with respect to. So when you said in the name of, you were saying with respect to, or with regard to, or on behalf of, or in the service of. He uses a rabbinic document called the Mishnah in a tractate called Zebakim. And he shows how that worked. An offering must be slaughtered into the name of six things. Does that make any sense? An offering must be slaughtered in the name of six things? Well, what name? Because if we're apostolic, if we're oneness, we need to know what name. But they're not talking about a name. What they mean is an offering must be slaughtered with respect to six things into the name of the offerer. That means on behalf of the offerer. Not the, not the offerer's name. The mission is not concerned with what his name is, whether it's John or Luke or Peter or Stevie. Into the name refers to on behalf of the offerer. So what we have a case of is Western people reading an Eastern text through Western eyes. And thinking that when they see in the name, that that means what it would normally mean to you. The name that you sign to the check when you go to the bank. But that's not what they're talking about. This was an idiom or a formula that was known to Jewish writers of that time. In closing, I'll leave you with this. Because... The burning question is, well, what are we going to do with Acts 2.38? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let me just say this. Ain't nothing wrong with Acts 2.38. Not a single thing is wrong with Acts 2.38. The problem is with how some people interpret it. Now, Peter tells the Jewish audience who had witnessed the outpouring of the Spirit, heard his gospel sermon, they didn't hear the gospel in tongues, they heard it in the same language, the Koine Greek language that Peter was preaching in. And when they are convicted, which is the result and evidence that the Holy Spirit was already moving upon them and regenerating them and granting them repentance. See, this is the thing that you got to understand. By the time Peter is saying this, the audience is already demonstrating that God is regenerating their heart. That is why they ask the question, what must we do? Because a person that has no desire to repent, no desire to believe, and no desire to be saved is not asking those kind of questions. And so, God's already at work in their heart, regenerating them and granting them repentance. Here's the interesting thing. The word baptize is in the passive. It's in the very same voice 
that be born again is in. So he's not commanding them to go be baptized. He's commanding them to repent. Being baptized was not something that they would actively do. It was something that they were to passively submit to upon believing the gospel. Watch this. But I thought when we are baptized, we're baptized in order to wash our sins away. No. Remission of sins or forgiveness of sins, as it should be interpreted properly in Acts 2.38, is connected to repentance, not baptism. Now, here's the mic drop. Here's the mic drop. Because this was part of Peter's sermon. In Acts chapter 3, the next time we hear Peter preach, which is only several days later, he is preaching right after the healing miracle of the man at the beautiful gate. And I want you to notice the structure of how Luke is reporting this. There is an outpouring or a move of God. There is amazement. There is a message of the gospel. There is conviction. And there is an appeal to respond to the gospel. Didn't that happen in Acts chapter 2? Watch this. Happening again. Watch how Peter gives the same reply as Acts 2.38. Look at it. Verse 19 and 20. Therefore, repent and turn back. You recognize that? But watch what you don't see. Therefore, repent and turn back. Why? So that your sins may be wiped out. Ladies and gentlemen, the wiping out of sin is the exact same thing as the remission of sin. It is the exact same thing as the forgiveness of sin. And what does Peter attribute forgiveness of sin to? Repentance. Repentance. Not baptism. And you notice he doesn't even mention baptism here. Because baptism doesn't save anybody. It doesn't wash anybody's sins away. Baptism is an outward demonstration. A, a reenacted parable of what Jesus did at the cross. Died, was buried, and rose again three days later. And when you trust in Jesus and go on to follow him as a disciple, the biblical community commands you to make a public profession of that faith by identifying yourself with Jesus' act. So you're not getting saved there. You are demonstrating that Jesus has already saved you. And that you are becoming one of his disciples. Because that's what baptism was always connected to. If you read John chapter 6, Jesus and his disciples, it says that when the Pharisees heard that Jesus was making more disciples and baptizing them, they got jealous. Notice how you have those two things together. Baptizing and making more disciples than John. Because that was the way that, that was the first point of discipleship, baptize them. It made the public statement that you were part of the faith community and that you were a follower of Jesus. Baptism never saved you. It was your indication to the world that he had saved you. It is faith and repentance, the two sides of that same coin, that produce atonement. Because forgiveness of sins is atonement. Remember we talked about expiation? 
What is that? So, okay, let's play it back now. Washing your sins away. What does that mean now? That's atonement. And so, we have been believing that atonement is applied in baptism. That's not the gospel. Atonement is applied at the moment we believe. And you can't believe without repenting and you can't repent without believing. It is at that moment that our sins are washed away. And that is exactly why several days later when Peter preaches to more Jewish people and they get convicted, he tells them, repent. Notice, that's something that God has to do in their heart. So that. So when folk want to debate about the meaning of Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for or eat. You now know how to interpret that. For can't mean in order to have your sins remitted it can only mean because your sins have been remitted that's what you tell them now because to believe that baptism remits sin is to add another condition to the gospel and as soon as you do that you are no longer preaching the gospel it is now another gospel in all other gospels are worthy of condemnation. All right, so here's how we'll, 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 we'll work this before we go to break. Here's what we'll do. So I am connected to the app, so there are some questions that have already come in, but here you can ask a question by going to this mic and even a follow-up question if you have it because this is the part that is going to be vitally important for the listening audience so if you have a question feel free to ask your question i also have some questions here that have um that have been submitted i'm going to answer only those questions in this segment that are related to this presentation and we'll deal with all of the other questions at another time but if you have a question please feel free i know you got them don't don't sit on it don't stew and, 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 and get up and ask that question. All right, we've got a question. Good. Good afternoon, everybody. Okay, so um, my question is on baptism. You know, based on all that you've said, my question is, does it then matter what you're baptized in? Uh, Jesus' name, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, you know, does it matter? Like, yeah, so I would, I, I would argue yes and no. And I'm going to tell you why. I, I, don't, I don't think that the bigger issue is which. The bigger issue is why. Because if a person is being baptized in Jesus' name, because they came to that conclusion based on the idea that the singular name of God is Jesus, then their baptism is not tied to the gospel, it's tied to heresy. Right? It, it's why. It's why. Right? Now, if, if somebody said, oh, well, you know what? I, 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 I believe in the one true God. I believe in God the Father, God the Son, and Holy Spirit eternally existing in three. I believe in all of that. Uh, but, you know, as a tradition, our church is always baptized in Jesus' name. Out of an understanding, however, of the finished work of Christ at the cross and all that good stuff, justification by faith, I would absolutely have zero problem with that. But if a person is baptizing in Jesus' name. Mind you, nobody ever made a debate out of it until 1914. And so today, the primary reason why people do baptize in Jesus' name is because they are convinced of that fatal argument that their predecessors made, and that is, 
that the name singular means that the name of the Father is Jesus, the name of the Son is Jesus, and the name of the Holy Spirit is Jesus. If that's why you are baptizing in Jesus' name, then your baptism is not connected to the gospel. Your baptism is connected to heresy. Fun fact, the Jehovah's Witnesses sometimes baptize in Jesus' name. And they don't even believe that Jesus is God. Isn't that interesting? Watch this. I'm going to blow you away. Mormons sometimes baptize in Jesus' name. And they believe in many gods. It's really why you're doing it. I would encourage people to stick to what the scripture says since we know that that is not a proper interpretation of Matthew 28, 19. And we also know that those verses in Acts are not alluding to a invocation or formula. It's indicating by what authority they practiced baptism. Right? So I would encourage people to follow what the early church always followed, and that is baptizing persons in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But if they did it the other way out of a biblical gospel understanding, it's 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 really it's really no big issue. Okay, so my follow-up question then is what if at the time of being baptized you did it based on the heretic doctrine that was preached? Mm -hmm. Do you need to be rebaptized? All right, now let me ask you this question. Let's just say that you came to uh, Grace Workshop Ministries from the kingdom hall and you had gotten baptized over there would that baptism really count for anything because that baptism was connected to a false gospel and a false understanding of the person and work of Christ right so you wouldn't even see yourself as being rebaptized. you would see yourself as getting baptized because you are now only now hearing the gospel right good Any, 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 any other questions? Come on. Yes, sir. Brother Damien, Damon. So there is a particular scripture that is normally used. I, I'm all the way over here. Fine. There's a scripture that is normally used. You know that that speaks about Noah, the flood, and so on. I think it's in the book. But you, I'll tell you, where it says the like figure, where unto baptism doth also now save us. Right? I know there is more, but that's one that is commonly used. So I'm asking, please deconstruct that one. Gladly. So what, what ends up happening is when people use verses to prove a, a, a view that the verse doesn't support, we call that proof texting. Right? And you can typically spot a proof text because it's usually picked out of the entire context. In other words, it's separated from its environment and it's used to stand alone to support an idea that the context doesn't even recognize. Peter had been writing about believers suffering. That's what he was writing about. And he had been telling them that they needed to suffer to the glory of God. And in order to encourage their suffering, he also talked about how their suffering was not only a way that brought glory to God, but it was a way that also distinguished them from other people in the world. You know what I mean by that. When we suffer, we know that there's a purpose. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us later. And if you suffer with them, you'll reign with them. We, we know that there's a greater eschatological purpose for suffering. But unbelievers, when they suffer, they cuss out folk, they kill folk, they, they steal, they do all kinds of things. And Peter is telling the believers that one way that you can provide an apologetic to the world is through your suffering. 
And then he goes further and says, you ought to think about when you're suffering how Jesus suffered too. And he arrives here at this point. And so suffering becomes a demarcation between the, those who are holy and those who are unholy, those who are saved and those who are unsaved. And so Peter makes the point here. He says in verse, uh, let me see, verse 17. He says, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. So you notice the contrast there. Then he says, for Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits of prison who in the past were disobedient. Now, I, uh, let me just say this. This will be not complicated, but stay with me. If you follow Peter from the beginning of his letter, he, he utilized a literary, a literary device called prolepsis which means to flash forward, to flash back and then to flash forward. Here's what Peter did that, that really informs this part of the verse. He said that the spirit of Christ was in the prophets from ancient times prophesying about what he was to accomplish. So Jesus was actually in those prophets speaking through them about things to come. That's what Peter said. And then he says that even the prophets didn't really fully understand what they were saying. So they inquired and searched diligently in order to understand. So you see what he's doing. He's got Jesus who is ascended into heaven. He flashes back and says Jesus was actually in the prophets then talking about what he was to accomplish flash forward in the future he continues this same thing when he says Jesus was also in Noah the spirit of Christ was in Noah when he was preaching and preparing the ark and what was Noah doing to the antediluvian world preaching to them that they should repent and turn to God. Peter says that was the spirit of Christ preaching through him. So it looks like when Jesus died that he's going to visit spirits who are in prison. But this is what you call prolepsis. What Peter is saying is that Jesus already preached to the disobedient in the days of Noah and as a result of their disobedience they are now in prison see that so this is another suffering motif Noah was suffering while he was preaching while the unrighteous were rejoicing and what ended up happening is that Noah was saved and the unrighteous was lost and water became the separation between the two. So he says that, this is what he says. Who in the past were disobedient when God patiently waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. In it a few, that is eight people, were saved through water. He's not saying that water saved them. He's saying that water became the, the, the demarcation between those who were saved and those who weren't. Those who were saved were above the water. Those who weren't were below the water. So the water's not saving anybody. The water becomes the lightning rod of distinction between who was and who wasn't. Right? And to go further, he says, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you not as the removal of dirt from the body but the pledge of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ what he's pointing to is how baptism just like in the days of Noah becomes a type 
of who is saved and who isn't. It's not the water saving them. It is an indication that those who have had faith in Christ have risen with him in baptism. They have been baptized. That is an indication of distinction between those who are still ungodly and, 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 and unsaved. So he's using baptism as a type of the same thing. He's saying, in other words, those who have gone down in baptism and have risen from the waters of baptism are different from those who have not. Those who have not are unbelievers, just like the unbelieving people of the antediluvian world. So he's not talking about baptism saving anybody. He's talking about, he says, notice the like figure. The like figure. So he's using baptism as a type or a picture of what happens to save people. We also, in baptism, identify with Jesus' death. And what does that speak to? It speaks to the fact that our old man has also been crucified. But when we're getting baptized, we're also identifying with Jesus' burial. And what does that speak to? Well, then the old man is now buried under the water. And when we come up from baptism, what does that speak to? That speaks to Jesus' resurrection. So the person that comes up out of the water is different than the guy that's under the water. Just like the people under the water in Noah's day were different than the people who were above it. Does that make sense? That's what Peter's doing with that text. But that involves exegesis. Folk who don't know the gospel don't practice exegesis. They practice eisegesis. They read into verses what they want it to mean because it fits their narrative and they don't even care about the surrounding context. You see what I mean? So, so nobody in that day believed baptism saved anybody. He's talking about the picture of baptism and, and what it represents. You see what I mean? Does that answer the question? Good. Another question. Warning. So, I have a lot of questions, but I'm just going to focus on this one, right? So previously, while discussing one is Pentecostalism, and I must say a lot of foolishness happened, and I must agree, but we cannot um, always put sound doctrine just because a false religion have a power, right? We throw out everything, but that's besides the point. What I want to ask, something you mentioned about dressing, right and our dressing showcasing holiness what i believe in and i'm sure that's what you believe in as well is that we are all saved by grace and this grace produces the faith that produces the works of righteousness right and as a result of the grace that each individual receives um it produces certain types of works which includes um a change in how a person portrays themselves my question to you is are you saying that let's say a person who is promiscuous a whorish woman she receives the gospel she gets saved she usually dresses in skimpy clothing right after receiving the grace that brings salvation Right, you're, you're telling me that she can continue in the skimpy dressing and say, this is, oh, I'm saved, I can continue with, with all of this um, inappropriateness. What's, what's the decision on that, or the conclusion? Okay, good. Let me ask you this question. What, what does skimpy dressing even mean? Um, I wouldn't want to get into that because it can get very messy. I mean, but, but you have to since you, you, you have a definition okay. for it. Okay, fine, fine. Let's imagine each individual here has, when, when I mention the, the, the term a whorish woman, everybody can imagine what that looks like. So based on your personal perception of a whorish woman, right? Based on your yeah, so, perception of a yeah, whorish woman. So, so you're, you're, you're making 
hang on, hang on, hang on, y'all. So let, let me help you with that. So you're, you're making several category mistakes. One, you're assuming that a person is whorish because they dress in a certain way. Right? Let, let me help you with that. There are people who are stepping on the end of their dresses that are more whorish than that. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. No, 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 no. But what I'm saying is it's a, it's a category mistake to make a one-to-one -one correlation between dress and sexual promiscuity. Because people with the longest dresses and, and, and turtlenecks and you can't even see their hand can be more promiscuous and often are than somebody that we would think or somebody else would think is, 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 you know, a loose woman because of, so, so we can't make the mistake of making that assumption because there's nothing about the way a person dresses that necessarily indicates that they behave a certain way. Yeah, so that's not the argument, yeah, that's right? A, that's an assumption that, you, that you'd be yeah, making. But that's not the argument that I'm proposing. What I'm really asking is, don't, don't you feel that there is some form of correlation between salvation and the way that we portray um, holiness? Even in 1 Peter chapter 3, and you have um, 1 Timothy chapter 2 that talks about holy women and how they dress to please and, and, and showcase the holiness of I God, got right? I got you. Okay, now I know where you're coming from. So good. So another category mistake is to conflate holiness with dressing. Because that's not what Peter was doing, right? So let me help you with what he was doing. Normally when we use the word modesty in the West, we use the word modesty in the West to refer to somebody whose clothing is less sexually revealing but modesty in the eastern world didn't have anything to do with that M modesty in I'm the not asking for a lecture on no, modesty. No, 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 no. what i'm asking for is do you believe that there is a correlation between the righteousness that sal true salvation brings and the, the demonstration of that salvation in how we walk, in how we talk, in how we conduct ourselves, our conversation. No, I got you. Is, that's I, the I, question. No, no, I, I understand. So that's what you call sanctification, right? So, so the word for holy and sanctification is hagias. It's the right. same word. So sanctification is not simply what we do. Sanctification is the work of the Holy Spirit in the believer conforming us and changing us into the moral character of Christ. Hold on. I want you to understand that. Now, that's the concern there. So holiness doesn't have anything to do with a certain look. Our behavior is transformed because the Holy Spirit is making us more like Christ in character. So if you want to know whether a person is holy, you're looking not at their dress, but their character. Because if the character doesn't resemble Christ, then sanctification is not working in that person. So, so, so that's what you got to look at. So, I, so it is a fact that sanctification does produce lifestyle change. But the lifestyle change is because... We are indwelled by the Spirit because we are justified. The Holy Spirit then begins to conform and change us into the character of Christ. That's not something that we sign up for by giving ourselves over to standards or rules. That is actually a work of the Holy Spirit inside the believer. Pseudo-holiness is all that Geno Jennings stuff. That's not real holiness, that's pseudo-holiness. In fact, that's a false gospel because folk who believe like that think that people who don't look like that aren't saved. Notice, they don't even care if you believed in Jesus. They just think, well, if you got on pants and jewelry, you can't be saved. Notice their concern and determination about salvation never has anything to do with the cross. It has everything to do with a look.
I don't believe that you understand where I'm coming from because I, I, I because I agree. I agree, but the Sir, issue is... I'm sorry. We ask a question and then we have a follow-up question. You've asked two follow-up questions. So we're going to ask you to retire. Thank you for your question. One other thing I'd like to say, brothers and sisters, please respect every questioner. A person comes to ask a question, allow them to ask the question. You don't have to make any sound. Every question is to be respected. Every questioner is to be respected. All right? So now, we had planned to have a break at 11.30, but we're going to ask you if we can serve you in your seats as you continue to ask questions. Is that all right? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Grace and peace, everyone. Yes. Um, I have one question broken down in two parts. The first part is whether someone who does not have a full intellectual appreciation or understanding of the doctrines of grace can, notwithstanding that, have a genuine experience and be equally a recipient of all the benefits that flow from that experience in the moment of belief. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Thank you for that question. So yesterday, just, just, a, just a quick reminder, yesterday I pointed two things out. One that I pointed out is, is that the full unpacking of all that the gospel is in salvation is something that we teach to believers. But earlier in the presentation, I also talked about what was absolutely essential to believe in order to be saved. We learned to understand the full ramifications of salvation and the gospel as we are taught in discipleship, the theology behind the gospel, that comes later. But the most essential aspects of what it means to have authentic biblical faith is what we believe about Jesus, who he is, what he accomplished in his life, what he accomplished in his death, the, the bodily resurrection of Jesus, and whether or not we are trusting in that, right? So now, if we are, then the Bible promises us and guarantees us that we have eternal life right then and there. In discipleship, we learn the full ramifications of it all later. So the second part of the question, which I think follows beautifully from what you just said, mm -hmm. can someone who has correctly apprehended that core belief, but have also been taught the wrong theology. Or no, let me change our phrase. Yeah. Can the wrong theology that follows the core belief negative that core belief experience? I got you. That's another good question. So let me, let me answer that like this. So it is impossible because since grace, salvation, all of that flows from theology proper, that is the right view of God, right? What we believe about God is essential to what we believe about the gospel. So I can demonstrate this very easily. Show me a group of any group, whatever they call themselves, that have the wrong view of God, but the right gospel. Can anybody do that? Show me a group that has the wrong view of God, but the right gospel. The Mormons have the wrong view of God, hence they have the wrong gospel. The Jehovah's Witnesses have the wrong view of God, hence they have the wrong gospel. My point is this, that having the wrong view of God results in having the wrong gospel. Because proper theology produces proper soteriology, that is the doctrine of salvation. And proper soteriology produces proper doxology that's right worship so we can't wor worship truly if we're not truly if we don't have the true gospel 
And we can't have the true gospel if we don't have the true understanding of God, right? So, so you see how one thing informs the other. So in reality, in reality, I would question a person who thinks that they are saved apart from what is essential about God. What has God essentially revealed? Let me just put it, let me, let me say it like this. Could a person say that I have accepted the gospel, but I don't believe that God is omnipresent? And I've never read anywhere where the omnipresence is a condition of salvation, but it would, it would go without saying that if you believe in the gospel, then what you believe about the God of the gospel would be consistent with how God has revealed himself in scripture. So if I've got a view about God, for instance, that he's not all-knowing, what kind of gospel would I really be believing with a God that doesn't know everything? You, you see how, how the one informs the other. And so if I'm hearing you, if I'm understanding what you're asking, what I would say to that is that if a person has not truly heard the gospel, you'll know it. Because what they believe about the gospel and what they believe about God falls short of what is revealed in scripture. Does that make sense? I've reached the maximum of the, my load no, concerns. No, 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 no. Okay. It, it, no. I'm just trying to reconcile because yeah. I agree with your first answer. Yeah. I haven't really reconciled with the second yeah. part of what you're saying. Because if I take the second part of what you're saying, then there's some amount of understanding that is required for the validity of belief. The second part kind of entails that conclusion from the first part. So for me to have a, because belief is the mechanism of salvation. Your belief in Christ accounts to you for righteousness as Abraham's experience was. Right. And then you're saying that theology follows belief. But if you're saying that wrong theology is indicative, or, or rather wrong theology is indicative of a false belief, then you need right theology in order to believe. And I have a difficulty with right. the conclusion to right. the extent it so says let, you let, need to understand yeah. it to believe. No, 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 I got you. So, I mean, and that's a really good, I, I like this question. When I was talking about the theological unpacking of the gospel, I'm talking about what we learn about what we've already believed. We're, we're, not, we're not coming to believe that later. We've already believed it and we're coming to understand, have a greater understanding about that. But there is a theology that goes into believing. That, that, that is a prerequisite. It's part of what believing is. Because remember I said earlier, yesterday, I said the contents of what must be believed. And I talked about a proper view of Jesus. So believing does entail having a biblical Christology. I can't say I believe the gospel and believe that Jesus is Michael the archangel. Would that be the gospel? I can't say I believe in the gospel and then I say, but uh, God is not eternal. He's going to die one day. It's like, right? You see what I mean? Now, nowhere is anybody saying that you've got to walk through a checklist of theology. But what you come to believe about the gospel is already informed by the theology of scripture. That's how we got to the gospel. And if we disagree with it or we don't believe it, it's because we have not truly believed the gospel. The gospel is telling us something about God, how he has acted in a redemptive history. And what we come to believe about God is critical to the gospel, right? For God, case in point, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world or loved the world in this way that he gave his one and only son, right? That whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Notice how that's telling you something already. That God the Father gave his son. So that means that the gospel entails an understanding about God that is more than just the actions of the Son. 
it involves the actions of the father as well. The father sent the son. The son didn't send himself. And yet we can't believe the gospel without even accepting that basic premise that the father sent his son. What if I reject that? Let me ask you this question. Would I be accepting the gospel? See that? Yeah. I can't reject that and still believe the gospel. <laughs> so, Elder, I'm, I've asked these persons to give me permission to exercise <laughs> pastoral privilege. Yes, sir. Because it's a great concern for me that everybody yes. understands. Yes. Because I'm their pastor. And I just want to say that, first of all, we have baptized, re-baptized several persons since we started the Grace Workshop. But several persons have come and they have said, we believe that we are just being saved. You weren't saved before. So, so we have done that. But I think what I'd like to ask to maybe help Matthew and all of us is, Persons here might be wondering, was I saved when I was part of another belief system? Maybe I could ask you, yeah. do you think you were saved when you were in the apostolic church? Gotcha. Because I think that a person can be saved if they believe the tenets of the gospel. But if they stay where they are, where there's wrong theology, then they then the living out of the gospel right. is going to be a serious problem. That's a great question. So listen, and let, let me answer that question in several ways. So it, it's, a nuanced, it's a nuanced question. So the first way I'll answer that is this. If the only gospel that you heard and accepted was a false one, that gospel did not save you. It is, however, possible for you to have heard the gospel and have believed it and then been deceived after you believed and spent time under deception. Now, if that's the case, well, that's my story. I got saved. I trusted in Christ was justified by faith because I was not disciple later when the oneness came by and and tripped me up with the baptism message that just seemed to make sense to me especially because I had come out of the nation of Islam and they were talking about this one God and I was like you know what that kind of mm, that sounds about right but my justification was not invalidated by my deception. And the fact that I was saved is evident in the fact that God says that when the Holy Spirit has come, he will guide believers into all truth. And so as a result of having been born again, having been filled with the Spirit and having been justified by faith and all of those things that happened the moment we believed, while I spent some time in error, God lovingly, through the Holy Spirit, brought me back into correction through his word over time. If a person stays in error, they're only really saying that they're not saved. Just like it is possible for believers to sin. But believers don't stay in sin. Believers repent and acknowledge their sin and line back up with the word of God. They don't remain in it. If a person lives in sin and never confesses it and never repents, they're only proving that they're not saved. Right? So, so it is possible. There are several things that are possible. The one is that there are, there may be many people over there who are truly saved but are currently under deception. If they are truly saved, then the Holy Spirit will guide them out of the error. Not if, not might, not maybe, but will. 
guide them out of the era. Now, one of the reasons that I believe that there are many people currently saved. Now, when I say that, I'm not saying they got saved by that message. I'm saying that they got saved by the gospel in spite of that message. That they had either come to believe before they became a part of it or while they were a part of it, they may have heard the gospel and have come to believe. Now, that is certainly possible. And one of the reasons why I say that is, is that if you haven't noticed, like all restorationist groups, the oneness group is highly dependent upon proselytizing. What do I mean? I mean converting people who claim to be Christians. Their greatest goal is to get a Baptist person in their church. Oh, we, 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 I witnessed to a Baptist guy and now he's getting baptized in Jesus' name. That's called proselytizing. And the reason for that is because they don't accept other denominations as being truly Christian. So they go after people who profess to be Christians and convert them. So by converting them, they're bringing them into error, really. But here's the problem. Some of those people that they are converting into error were people who were truly justified by faith before. Because that's where they got them from, churches. 90% of people who end up in the apostolic church came from somebody's Baptist church, Methodist church, Episcopal church, Lutheran church, or Presbyterian church. That is a fact. 10% or less are just raw sinners that don't go nowhere. 90% of them are people that they converted by convincing them that they have not heard the whole truth. So if that is true, then it is very possible that many of the people that they have converted were already saved when they got converted into the era. And if they are saved, we can expect for the Holy Spirit to guide them out of the era back into the truth. But again, if your only orientation to Christianity comes from a false gospel, then you're not saved. No different than a Jehovah's Witness hearing that message would be saved. If that is the thing that they, the message that they believe brings them into fellowship with God, no other gospel but the true gospel saves. That gospel can't save anybody. If that's all you ever heard, if that's all you ever knew, and that's all you ever believed, then that gospel never saved you. But if you have in fact heard the gospel and you have recognized the difference between what you had come to believe and what the gospel truly means, and you've come to believe that, then you could that could have been true before or even during. I know many people who just in their car listening to Tony Evans or Chuck Swindoll heard the gospel for the first time while they were members at an apostolic church and came to believe. So it can happen either before or during. All I would say is nobody is saved if the message that they heard and believed was that message and that's it. If you've never heard the gospel before and that's the gospel that you thought was the gospel, that gospel never saved you. That's what I believe. So there are in fact many people over there who are in fact lost. That's what we need to be concerned about. That there are many people who have never truly heard the gospel who need to so that they can be saved. Because as long as they're relying on that message, that message is not going to save them. And, and, and so that's how I would, I would answer that question. And hopefully that, that helps you. Uh, okay, sir. Um, could you explain for me now, Acts chapter 19, especially verse 16. Then said Paul, 
John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, They should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Yes. When they heard it, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. Could you explain that? Because yes. I, I am under the understanding that those persons were already baptized unto John baptism, and then now, after they heard what Paul preached, then they re-baptized in the name of Jesus. That's what I was taught. So gotcha. could you explain that for me, please? Excellent. Gladly. So what, what's happening there in Acts chapter 19 is 20 years after the events of the day of Pentecost. These men that Paul runs into in Ephesus were John's disciples. They were his disciples. That means they were his students. They learned from him. He was their rabbi, their teacher. Two of, G two of John's disciples became Jesus' disciples. But after John was killed, the rest of John's disciples fled the area and moved north into Turkey. Ephesus is about 1,200 miles from Jerusalem. They fled there to flee danger. Their teacher had gotten killed and they thought they were next. When they were learning from John, John told them that I baptize with water under repentance. But the one coming after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So when John baptized them, their baptism was a fruit of repentance. So their baptism was an indication that they that their hearts had turned towards God in believing the gospel of the kingdom. Remember that Malachi said that Elijah would come back and he would do something. He would turn, metanoe, the heart of the children back to the father. So when John comes to fulfill that, he says, turn, for the kingdom of heaven is happening right now. So his disciples, in order to demonstrate that they had turned in their heart to believe the message of the kingdom, proved that turning by baptized, be, being baptized. So that baptism was a baptism of repentance. That baptism was an act of repentance. It was a demonstration that they had repent that they had repented. Now, they're not rebaptized in reality. That's not a rebaptism. So when Paul says to them, when he recognizes who they were, he says, oh yeah, you were baptized by John unto repentance. And so he asked them a very important question because he has no idea that they've been living in Ephesus for 20 years. He says, well, did you ever hear about the fulfillment of what your teacher said? I baptize with water, but the one coming after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And you'll notice their response. We hadn't heard whether there was any fulfillment to that. That's what they mean. Why? Because they have been out of the area. They haven't even been back to Judea. They have been anywhere. But they, they're, they're 1,200 miles away from there. So they have no idea that the promise of the Father has been fulfilled 20 years earlier. So that's what Paul's asking them. And when he tells them it has, he prays for them so that John's prophecy to them comes to fulfillment. So then they receive the Holy Spirit. Now, they were already believers. They had already been justified by the faith that they had in the Messiah that John said is already here. Behold the Lamb of God. He was telling his disciples that takes away the sins of the world. They believed John. They, all of that was already true. The only thing they had not received was the promise of the Spirit because it wasn't being offered at that time because Christ had not yet ascended, resurrected, and ascended. Now they're 20 years removed from the event and Paul is trying to explain to them that this has all come to pass. And so then they receive the Holy Spirit. When Paul baptizes them, he's not re-baptizing them as though 
their first baptism doesn't count. Repentance always counts. In fact, because they believed and repented, that's exactly why they were already justified. That baptism was a baptism of discipleship. What Paul is saying, well, good. Now that you have the Spirit of God in you, you have just become one of Jesus' disciples. They had been John's disciples before, and by baptism, they are now indicating that they are followers of Jesus. So that baptism didn't have anything to do with their salvation. It had everything to do with the fact that they are now becoming followers of Jesus, wherein in the past they have been followers of John. So that baptism is not salvific. It's exactly what I said before. It's an indication of their discipleship. So now they're Jesus' disciples instead of John's, right? So that's not a rebaptism. That is a baptism of discipleship. Does that make sense? Yeah. So they're not being baptized over or again. This is a different baptism, a baptism indicating that they are now followers of Jesus the Messiah, no, no longer of John. That makes sense? Excellent. Okay, good. So, uh, out, of, out of respect for time, so what we're going to do, we'll deal with some other questions in another part of the session, but uh, no more questions after this because we do have a very important presentation that's coming. I promise you, you don't want to miss this. What, what's, a, what's coming is how I study. So if you want to know how I study, what kind of resources I use, where I get it from, that's this presentation that's about to come. You're not going to want to miss that. But we want to give him time to make that presentation. So we're just going to have these last three questions here. And then we're going to, uh, to cut it off. Okay. So, um, all right. So does the, the trans-like behavior that is associated with Speaking in tongues, um, the infilling of the Holy Ghost. So growing up, I've been brought up in that culture. So they have, there's a trans-like behavior that's associated with speaking in tongues. Um, it's something that I have experienced myself. I'm not saying it's right. But right. I'm just saying that I have experienced it. So I'm not going to pretend like it didn't right. happen. So it did happen. So is it associated or does it have any relation to... Um, or African heritage, and why I ask that, because I've noticed, um, I love history and I love reading about, especially Caribbean religions, and I've noticed that this behavior is really associated with persons who have an African background, persons of a European background, I've noticed they don't tend to display this type of behavior. Um, so I'm just asking if, it's, if it has any relationship. So, for example, revivalism, I don't know if you're aware. Pokemania, come on here. Revivalism. Kumina, yeah. I've noticed in some of Bob Marley's um, presentations, he gets into a trance as well, and he also speaks in tongues. And in, in, in speaking with other musicians too, they'll shift who are not um, of what they would say, like precious faith. Um, they have spoken of that experience right. too. Right. Yeah, so... Uh, I wouldn't say that it is particularly um, related to people of African descent uh, because historically we have found uh, the same kind of uh, trance and um, what they would call pseudo-glossolalia or gibberish kinds of um, pseudo-speech in India, uh, in other religions, even during, she mentioned not so much in European religions, but even during Paul's time, uh, you had the um, you, you you had the uh, you had various um, Greco-Roman practices that involved going into trances and speaking unintelligibly. I think it was called one was called the uh, the Oracles of Sybilis, 
and uh, there, there were a number of other uh, European uh, religious expressions that involved the same thing. So uh, it's not particular just to traditional African religions. You'll find it uh, pretty much anywhere around the world. In fact, uh, language linguists who have studied the phenomenon of speaking in tongues in various religions found similarities in terms of the way that it's practiced. Uh, the, the pseudo, the mimicking of language and the repetitions of certain phonetic sounds, uh, going into trances like behavior, so forth and so on, rhythmic dancing and all kinds of things. So it's not just particular to people of African descent. You'll find that in religious expressions uh, all around the world. And so we just have to be careful that what we're not doing is banking our faith on what we've experienced. We've got to take our experiences and test them by the word of God. I'm not saying you didn't have the experience, but having an experience doesn't mean that the experience is of God, right? So, so we've got to submit our experiences to what scripture says about it. So what I've come to believe about my former practice of doing it, because I used to do it too. And so some people ask me all the time, so what do you think about that? I said, well, I, I see it as learned behavior. I see it as cultural. I see it as what I learned to do as a result of the people that I was around. And, um, but one thing that I can't do is I can't take that behavior and plot it in scripture because there's nothing in scripture that speaks to people speaking non-cognitive, non-human gibberish language. The gift of tongues was actual human languages. And they weren't always associated with being filled with the spirit, right? So, so we made a mistake in attempting to make that the universal indication of a person that's been indwelled by the spirit. So we have to be careful about that aspect as well. Jesus said, we'll know them not because they speak in tongues, but by the fruit that they bear. So the evidence of a Christian life is not found in phenomenological signs. It's actually found in fruitful, in fruit bearing, in whether the person has Christ-like character that has been produced in them by the Holy Spirit, right? So, so I would say that we want to be careful about how we associate even that practice with necessarily being filled with the Spirit. Yes, sir. Um, my question is really on the nature of the Godhead. Mm -hmm. It's easier for me to see distinctives between the Father and the Son, Jesus. You know, the Father can't die. The Father can't sleep. The Father doesn't grow, doesn't learn obedience, doesn't... So it's easy to see distinctives between the, the Son and the Father. Not so clear when we are looking at distinctives between the Father and the Holy Spirit. So I just wanted to ask if you could um, kind of help us to understand um, some of those distinctives between the Father and the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm going to help you in John chapter 14 and then in John chapter 16. I want you to notice the way Jesus says this. Um, in verse 15, he says it like this. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. And I, which is an expression of self-identity, I will ask the Father. That's somebody that Jesus is identifying other than himself. When he speaks of himself, he says, I. When he spoke of the Father, he said, the Father. He says, and he, that is the Father, will give you another counselor so Jesus distinguishes himself from the father and then here distinguishes the father from the Holy Spirit he said the father will give you another counselor right so the counselor that the father is giving is not himself it's another and the word there that he uses is the same word that he says later that I'll pray to the Father and he'll give you 
another comforter. It's the Greek word alos, not heteros, but alos. Alos means another of the same kind. So this would indicate that the comforter or the Holy Spirit has the same attributes and qualities as the father, but he's not the father because he's another. In the very same way, when Jesus has told his disciples that I've been comforting you this whole time, but I'm going to ask the father and he's going to give you another comforter. He's saying that the second comforter is like him, but not him. Hence, another of the same kind. So they have the same qualities, divine qualities, but they're distinct in person. If, if he were talking about a totally different being altogether, he would have said heteros. That would be a different being but he says another comforter because the holy spirit just like himself and just like the father has the same attributes of, of of divinity right so he's another of the same kind yet distinct from right so jesus has has told us that the father will send another comforter the last indication of that is in Galatians in Galatians I think it is chapter yeah chapter 4 in Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 Paul said when the time came to completion God sent his son that's God the father sent his son the word sending there is apostalion it's from the same root that we get the word apostle the word apostle means sent one. Now, if Jesus sent the apostles, you wouldn't confuse the one being sent with the one doing the sending. The apostles weren't Jesus. They were sent by him. And that's why the Paul, or Peter rather, later says that Jesus is the apostle of our faith because he was sent by the Father. But you'll notice that the father doesn't only send the son born of a woman born under the law to redeem those under the law it says and because you are sons God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying out the father so then God the father also sends the Holy Spirit so you could see the distinction between the father and the Holy Spirit by the father sending not just the Son, but the Father sending the Holy Spirit into the hearts of those who believe on Jesus by faith, right? So it is in the sending that we also see distinction in person between the two. Does that make sense? Good stuff. One last question. All right, sir. Thank you. Um, I, the, the question is, I just, it's just one question with no follow-up. I'm going to preface it by saying I think we have suffered uh, under the disguise of false gospels. And we have built our lives on, you know, on, the, on the, new, the nuances and the precepts of those bad gospels. And the de deconstruction that we're doing now is, is, is often, if not completely, dependent on the necessary work of sanctification. Right? Even in our response to God post-regeneration, we, we have to completely rely on God mm -hmm. because we see, and, and his righteousness, because right. we see Adam's response to the conviction of sin, he sowed fig leaves, which was insufficient. Right. Um, even in our day, with the hampering of bad theology and, and the, be the benefit and blessing of the only gospel, the re really the only true gospel, you know, sin is so interwoven in our belief that it's never a one and done kind of process. So, so my question is, in light of what we've heard of the gospel, in light of what we have now been taught and now believe, at least for me, how, how does the gospel inform church discipline? How, how do we go about administering church discipline in light of scriptures like John chapter 3 where Jesus talks to Nicodemus about 
birth being wherever and whenever by the Spirit of God. You know, often we see there is a gap between the reformation of behavior right. and the reformation of character. How, how does the gospel inform how we do church discipline? That's a good question. So I, I, would, I would answer that question by saying thank you. That um, if a person is a member of a church and they have not yet accepted the gospel as they're working through it, studying, learning, I would say this, that there is, a, that there is in theology what we call an effectual call. And the effectual call of God means that ultimately the elect of God will hear the gospel and receive it. What the effectual call doesn't mean is, is that they will receive it the first time they heard it or even the second or third time. It means ultimately God will open their hearts as he did Lydia through regeneration to receive it. The effectual call means that the call of God on their life will accomplish what it has set out to do. That may happen over some time. So the person can go through multiple times hearing the gospel and not believing. Because every elect believer at one point heard the gospel and may have dismissed it at that point but later you received it and that is because God's call is effectual but that doesn't guarantee that they'll receive it when we want them to receive it it means that they ultimately will receive it because God's grace is irresistible it means that ultimately the elect will not resist the pull and the tug of God on their heart. The Bible says no man comes to the Father except he first be drawn. And drawn is actually a process. It's not something that may happen in one singular moment. So right now there may be people who are hearing the gospel against what they have heard and they are being drawn but at another point the call of God is going to be effective in their heart by accomplishing what it has set out to do that may not be today and it may not be tomorrow but it will definitely be in God's sovereign will they definitely will come to Christ. That is, if they hear his voice. That is, if they have been regenerated. If they are the elect, they will respond positively to the gospel. We have to give them time. We, we can't put them under church discipline because we would have to treat that like anybody hearing the gospel We've got to allow God to do the work in them to accomplish that work. Just like for some of us, like it took me 20 years to finally abandon oneness Pentecostalism. Now, I wasn't being hard-headed. I really wasn't. I wasn't being hard-headed. I was, I, I was working through it alone because people were coming to me for answers I couldn't go to anybody else for answers because people were depending upon me to help them understand. So I had to wrestle with it by myself. And so that, that took time. And part of the time that it took was not that I wasn't believing. In fact, I had already migrated theologically some years earlier. But like so many others in here who might even be in here right now, you already know this is true, but you're worried about what people are going to say about you. You're worried that they're going to say you're a backslider. 
You're worried that they're going to say you're not really saved and that you've abandoned the faith. And so you delay your departure out of fear of the blowback that you know comes from that culture. That was another part of the reason that I kind of hung around a little bit longer than I should. But after a while, I realized that the gospel tells me that I've got to pick up my cross and I've got to count the cost. And if that means that I've got to suffer rejection and hatred and, and abandonment and alienation, well, that comes with walking with Jesus. And let me tell you something. Let me just say this. Because there is a, there is a, let me, let me, let me, let me just say it like this. I want to use all kinds of wisdom with this, but I still want to say it with love and with boldness. When I was oneness and somebody came and we said that they had prayed through and got the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues, we didn't care what their situation was at home. If the guy had a girlfriend of 14 years, all we knew is that now that you got the Holy Ghost, you better go sleep at your brother's house, go back to your mama and your daddy's house, but you can't go back to that house. And we didn't care about what their financial situation was. We didn't care about what they had to work out. And to, because, I mean, if you're living together for 14 years, you got a lot together. But, you know, when to us, because you got the Holy Ghost, holiness demands that right now, you cut that off. I find it interesting, though, that the same folk now who are finding out that that ain't the truth are struggling with making a right now decision because all of a sudden, oh, you know, I got, I, I know a whole lot of people over there and I got a whole lot of friends and I got a whole lot of family. And now all of a sudden, there's no urgency like what we were demanding when we thought folk had the Holy Ghost. You know what that's telling me? That's telling me that you're not counting the cost of believing the gospel. Believing the gospel means that some people are going to jump out of a three-story window and break their leg for the cause of Jesus. And it also means that somebody else is going to have to jump from 15 floors. And you might look at me and say, well, you're not going to lose as much because you only had to jump from the second floor. But watch this. There was another person that believed the gospel that had to jump from the 50th. What I'm saying is that's not what they had to do to be saved. That's what happened to them because they had believed the gospel. And what a lot of us have tried to do is escape the consequences of believing the true gospel because we don't want to be associated with the blowback of being called a backslider. I'll be frank even further. Some people want to be apostolic more than they want to be Christians. Because if we're being honest, if you look at how all cults operate, one of the things that glue them together is this identity complex. You come to think certain things about you based on an identity that was forged in that community. And when you leave that community, you throw that identity away. And some folks are in the throes of an identity complex because leaving that is saying I'm no longer distinct. I'm no longer special. I'm no longer, I no longer have this truth, this revelation, and all of the things that we used to distinguish ourselves as being more special than everybody else. All of those things went into your identity. But you want to know what happens when you build your faith around identity? You become an idolater. The only identity that a Christian needs is a Christ identity. 
not an apostolic identity. That's why you got to throw that stuff away. I'm just a born again believer, holy roller, speaking in tongues with mighty burning See, That's your identity. But the real identity based on the gospel is that you, your life has now been hidden in Christ. And so it's only pride keeping you hanging on to the identity. I'm just trying to be honest. That's what keeps a lot of us hanging on is that we don't want to let go of the identity because now I'm no longer special. Now I no longer have the truth. Now I no longer have the revelation. Now I can't identify myself as being holy based on the way that I dress. Now I can't say, I'm saved, look at me, and then look at you. You're not. Now I can't look at somebody with a pair of earrings and say, look at her. She, 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 she's not, she ain't really saved. But those are the things that we actually used to do, right? So, because that formed our identity, it made us feel like we were because of what we did. And what the gospel is demanding is that we repent of that and that we hide ourselves by faith in Christ. He is our identity. Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forward to those things which are before, I press towards the mark of the higher calling which is in Christ Jesus. I think the fact of the matter is, is that Many of us have made an idolatry out of the identity of being apostolic. You already know it's not true. You already know it's not true because you've heard the gospel and you know that's not it. So what hinders you? What hinders you? That's a self retrospective kind of question what keeps you holding on to it what prevents you from grabbing hold fully apprehending the gospel of Jesus what ties you back to it I'm asking you to have God search your heart and look and see that there's not idolatry of identity in your heart that causes you to hold on out of either fear, intimidation, or identity complex. But at the end of the day, the gospel calls for us to take up our cross and follow him. Oh, but you just don't understand how it's going to be. No, 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 I do. But the gospel says that we all have to take up our cross. I can't prevent what kind of cross you're going to carry. But it doesn't make it an excuse to not believe the gospel. I've talked to thousands of oneness people, pastors included, and they all got excuses. I'm deep in the fellowship. Well, you know, that person that belonged to the church of God was deep in the fellowship and you ain't seem to care about that because you just needed them to get baptized in Jesus' name and then forsake all that to come over to your church. But now that you are hearing what the true gospel is, you got all the excuses in the world to do what you used to expect other people to do when you thought what you had was the truth. See how that works? I know it's tough. But nobody can prevent the consequences that we all have to experience with following Jesus. I lost a whole lot of friends. People I used to preach for won't even talk to me anymore. Like, won't even look at me. See me in the street, walk right by like they didn't even see me. And I'm talking about people I've, I've, I've stayed in their homes. I mean, we were brothers, stayed with them, ate with them, cried with them, won't even look at me, won't even have a conversation. You don't think that hurts? That's the cross that I have to pick up as a result of believing the gospel. 
and every one of you will have to bear a cross that is the consequences of what happens when you believe the early church many of them were killed they were persecuted thrown in prison split up from their families sawn in half all kinds of horrible things because they were walking with Jesus and yet the message over and over in the New Testament was counted all joy when you experience different kinds of suffering. So what's stopping you? What's stopping you? I, 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 we got to get past the matter here. We have to get past the matter here. But listen to this. There's some folk who they don't even want to engage in the conversation. And you want to know why? Because they're afraid that if they hear the gospel, they can't unhear it. That's why they're not here today. Because if they heard it, they can't unhear it. That's why they don't even want to be part of the conversation. Because if what they believe is so true, then why don't they ask questions? Why don't they just at least inquire? I mean, because if I was your teacher, and if I, if, if I was their teacher, the teacher that they were saying I was, and if I was the scholar that they were saying I was, and if I was the apologist, that they were saying I was, you would think that if I've come to a conclusion different from what I was teaching them, that you would think that, well, maybe we ought to just hear him out because there's a chance he might know something that we don't. Especially when you claim that what you know is what I taught you. So if I'm saying there's a problem with that, I mean, wouldn't it be reasonable to just say, maybe he might know something that I don't know, that I haven't even considered. But they won't even come to the table. Because what they really want is to be more apostolic than they are Christian. One pastor told me after spending six hours on a Caribbean island, that will go unnamed. <laughs> we sat for six hours after a church service and I explained the gospel to him. You want to know what his response was? If I believe what you are saying and I have no reason to doubt it, what's going to be left of this? That's what he asked. Me. What's going to be left of this? His concern was, it's not going to be any more culture. It's not going to be any more movement. If we, if we listen to what you're saying, what's left of this? So till this day, he's doing everything that he can to hold on to that, even though he knows this is true. Because he doesn't want to lose that. That's where he gets his identity from. That's where he gets his validation from and all of these different kinds of things. And he's concerned about what he's losing rather than what he's gaining. I'm just telling you how the culture taught us to think. It taught us to lock every window and door and submit to being anti-intellectual. Just settle it is what they wanted us to do. Don't ask questions. Don't study. Just settle it. Just be good with what we're telling you is true. That's anti-intellectualism. That's not being a Berean. That's not being a student of scripture. That's, being an, that's parking your brain at the door. That is exactly how cults behave. That's exactly how cults behave. And I am calling you on this day to hear the gospel, receive it, make a decision in your heart. Make the right response to the gospel. Don't, 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 don't sit on the fence. 
Don't say, I don't understand. I'm going to tell you something about understanding. Faith precedes understanding. Understanding follows faith. Not understanding is not an excuse to not believe. In fact, claiming that you don't understand is just low-key rejection. You're just trying to reject in a low-key way. You're just really saying, I don't believe, but you're passing it off like, I'm just still kind of looking into the matter. No, 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 no. You're just not believing. I'm telling you to believe, to repent and believe the gospel, to let go, let go of the former things, let go of the past things, and accept the gospel truth. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. I know where you've been. I know. I, I was part of that culture. I was an architect, a builder, in making people feel bad for leaving. I participated in it. I threw threats out. You know what happened to the last sister that left the church? She got ran over, got hit by a car. I used to do the same thing. Make people feel bad. Make them feel scared. Spook them out. I know. I, I, I was part of that culture. I did it. But I'm telling you to allow God to give you Holy Ghost courage and do what is right based on the truth regardless of the consequences regardless of what people will say if, if you're part of that church and you've heard the gospel then leave that church and get with a Bible believing Christ centered gospel sound doctrine biblically orthodox church I don't care how much family you got there, how many friends you got there. You can't grow apart from the gospel. You can only grow where the gospel is preached. That's the fact. And I'm telling you, just leave and get with a church. Get with this church. I mean, let's just be straight down the line. Get with this church. God has called this church for such a time as this to be a lighthouse for the gospel to people who have been living in Jamaica for 50, 60, 70, 80 years or longer and have never even heard the gospel the first time. Think about that. Think about that. Most people who live in the Caribbean, Trinidad, Cuba, it doesn't matter. Most of the time in those places, Christianity is represented by Seventh-day Adventism, Rastafarianism, Oneness Pentecostalism, Jehovah's Witness, or some other subculture group of Christianity. Most people who live in Caribbean cultures have never truly been exposed to a gospel-centered church. That is a fact. The statistics, the research points that out. So God has led you to a place that is a light for the gospel in a place that thinks the gospel is about law keeping. Holiness standards and all kinds of other stuff. This church stands as a light bearer, a beacon against all of that darkness to bring the gospel to people who have never heard it the first time. Do you, do, you, do you feel that? Do you understand how important that is? Jamaica needs a gospel witness. The Seventh-day Adventists are not witnesses of the gospel, and they are plenty. They got billboards. Jamaica needs gospel witness. And that's got to be a church that plants more churches, that encourages believers to go out and do personal evangelism. That has to come from a church like this. That might encourage some of those other churches to hear the gospel, receive it, and then convert. And then those pastors get retrained so that they can become Gospel churches producing gospel disciples. And God has called you to be part of that. He's called you to be part of that.
listen, in order, to, in order for this to really take off, we've got to all be students of the word of God. Let me set this up for Pastor Matt right now. You can't fall in love with a God that you don't know about. If you're going to really get with this, you've got to all commit to becoming students of the word of God. I'm not saying you all got to be theologians and Bible scholars, but all of us do theology. The real question is what kind of theology are we going to do? We're either going to do good theology or bad theology. And if we're doing good theology, we got to have the right resources in order to be able to do it. You got to have the right resources. So one of those resources is, is the pastors of this church that are teaching the word of God. Other resources are what you need to be able to take what you have learned and then start studying even on your own time. You need resources to do that. And so I am asking you to make a commitment to become a student of the word of God, to learn the word of God, have a high value and view of scripture, hold it up above everything, how you feel, what you've ever experienced, hold the word of God up as supreme. But if you study the word of God, you'll grow in your faith, you'll grow in your understanding of the word of God, and you'll be able to communicate even to people the fact that we were apostolic is by God's sovereign plan. How about God wants to use you to share the gospel with other oneness people who have never heard it? How are you going to do that if you've never truly studied it yourself?